Oh man. We'll get into wade out into the deep this morning. Hope we don't get over our head and drown. Father, in Jesus' name, give me un understanding, wisdom in the scriptures. In thy sweet name we pray. Amen. All right, turn to the book of Revelation chapter 16 this morning with me, please. The Apocalypsis, chapter number 16. Let's start reading with verse number 1, Revelation chapter number 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. The first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, and wast, and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. That's a good lesson to learn in life today, living and dealing with people daily on a daily basis. Uh, things like that do not bring people to repentance. You cannot drive someone to God. You cannot force conversions. It's been tried in the past when uh, Constantine uh, crossed the Milvian Bridge and uh, I forget his opponent, but as he crossed that bridge he saw a sign in the heavens said, by this conquer, and it was a cross. And he took it by that, that God was on his side, and so he did conquer and became the uh, undisputed Caesar of Rome. And uh, when he did, uh, he uh, stopped the persecutions and declared Christianity to be the state religion. And by doing that, he commanded his armies to be baptized. So all of the armies of Constantine were baptized and became Christians. Of course, you understand they weren't, but they were forced into conversion. They still worship Mithra and all the rest of their gods and this and that, but to maintain the status quo and their rank in the army and so forth, they became Christians. You don't force conversions. But Constantine, of course, I suppose he meant well, but uh, you do know what happened when Constantine became Roman emperor. He married the church and state. And that's the problem. And that's always a problem, always will be, always has been. That's why they came to this country to get away from a European church state setup. But anyway, the Bible says here that uh, they did not repent. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the sea of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. They gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains, their sores, repented not of their, e of their deeds. Now note verse number 12 very carefully. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. It's still there. Our boys are over there fighting right now. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. This is the satanic trinity. It is the counterpart of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Satanic Trinity, therefore, becomes a, a, uh, a, uh, to, be, to be set over in contradistinction to the truth, always to counter the truth. God and Satan, the truth and a lie. And uh, this is the issue you have to deal with. It's set before you two paths. Which way are you going to go, truth or lie? 
You have to choose the right or the wrong. It's a choice that you make. People make choices every day in life. So the Bible says here in verse 13, three unclean spirits like frogs. Now, in the Bible, certain creatures are chosen to be like unclean spirits. The Holy Spirit is never like a frog, but an unclean spirit is like a frog. The Bible uses a dove to represent the Holy Spirit. But here in the book of Revelation, chapter number 16, I want you to notice that the Bible just speaks matter-of-factly. It doesn't try to prove. It just simply states it as a fact that unclean spirits exist. It's that. You either accept that or you don't. Now, the church I came up in, uh, it was a kind of a quasi, iffy deal, like, uh, well, they might, have, uh, they might have had unclean spirits in the time of Christ, but uh, we don't really have to worry about anything like that today. And people in law enforcement know better. And people in these hospitals out here know better. And people that are counseling with people day in and day out know better. And people who are in forensic pathology and so forth know better. Because they know that there, there are spirits in this world. And once these spirits in this world take over a person, however they might do that, then you have on your hands a devil. Now, someone come along today and they'll say, to strictly speaking, theologically, there is but one devil. Truth of the matter is, you can go from Genesis to Revelation and you'll never find that said anywhere in the Bible, that there's just one devil. A devil is, generic, is a generic term, translated usually from diablos. And when you come over here into the Spanish language, it's essentially the same as it is in Latin, diablo. And Rio Diablo means the river of the devil, see. So you have Diablos translated as devil. But what, who, or it is a devil? Throughout the Bible, many things show up as devils. One of these we find that we're going to talk about here this morning is a demon. The word demon is never, you don't find it in the English Bible. But you'll find many of the words translated as evil spirits, you'll find the origin of that word as demon. But the word demon is also translated in the New Testament as gods. So you've got to be careful. You've got to watch what you're doing. A demon is an evil spirit. But I want to go take you back for just a few minutes here this morning, 2,000 years ago or even further, into the time of the golden age, they call it the golden age of Greece, where you have Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Maximander, and the rest of them. And take you back to the golden age of Greece and let you see what they believed about a demon. It helps to understand this greatly because you need to understand that you're living in 2008. You're an American culture. Most people today, the only thing they understand is what they're taught by their culture. It's what they learn by sight, by experience, and what they know. They don't really take the time to do any real research into finding out what these words mean. And this should be a, a, a very helpful study for you because it will show you how that the Bible stands apart completely. This is another way of understanding the Scriptures stand apart from what was believed 2,000 years ago. Let's go back and let's look at the word demon. The word demon is, uh, comes in different forms. Daimonion, which is the noun of it. To demonize is to be possessed with a demon or possessed with an evil spirit. Uh, Homer said that the gods are supernatural men. And he said when he said gods, he used the word daimonion. Now let me explain something clearly here now. When I said the golden age of Greece, what language am I talking about? Who's buried in Grant's tomb? We're talking about Greece. Greek, exactly. Now, there is a, there's a little difference between the Greek of Homer, Socrates, Aristotle, and the rest of them, and the Greek of the New Testament. And here's the difference. The Greek of the New Testament is what's called Koine Greek. Koine Greek is common Greek. It's the Greek spoken by the people who lived. It's the language of the street. It's the language of commerce. It's the language they used. You have classical Greek which is the language of Homer, Aristotle, and the rest of them, okay? But they're still Greeks. And the words uh, that they used are the same words that are used in the New Testament. So if you said daimonion to, to Homer or Socrates or Plato, he'd know immediately what you were talking about. Oh, that's nothing new to him. 
But his definition of what it meant would be altogether different from what you believe and understand. See, that's what's important here. This is, the, this is what's important to come to the very basis of what I'm talking about. What he understood it to mean and what the New Testament describes it to mean, two entirely different things. See? So the entrance of thy word giveth truth. It giveth understanding to the simple. The word of God is the, is, is the light. It is, it, is the, it, is, it, is, it is the path. It is the light that shines on my path. Path. It's the light that shineth on my path. It is illumination. It is wisdom. The Word of God, therefore, I will go to every time to define a term, the meaning of a word. See what I mean? I will go to the Bible, not common usage, not even the usage of today. When you trace the etymology of words, go back, find out where they came from, see how they're used today, you'll find most of the time a word is not used the way it was originally meant to be. That's why a uh, unabridged dictionary is such a useful thing. So Homer said the gods are supernatural men. And uh, uh, to quote some of these, uh, uh, Hesiod, for example, uh, taught that they were the messengers of gods to men. That therefore these demons, and understand this now, when, when these men use the word demon, they don't have attached to it this stigma like you have today. When they said demon, they're talking about a spirit, but it's a spirit that's not necessarily bad. They believe that a demon was something that someone wanted. They believe demons were spirits that carried messages from the higher gods to mankind. See? Now I want you to start putting two to two together, two and two together here in just a moment. And you'll see what I'm you'll see how this shows up and helps us. Uh, <clears throat> the Gentiles, for example, like Plato, and everybody knows about Plato, he said, quote, every demon is a middle being between God and mortal. See? All right. An intermediary. See? Now, the Bible says in the last days we'll have doctrines of what? Devils. Devils. See? What caused Plato to believe that a demon was an intermediary? Between the gods and men. Is there a religion on this earth that teaches that there is another intermediary between God and men? There is one God, one God, and one mediator between God and men. That's plain as it can be. How in the world? Can you mistake that? I mean, there's no way, there's nothing else in the Bible that would cause you to even say, well, maybe we need to interpret it a different way. No, that's as plain as it can be. There's only one access to God. That one access to God is through Jesus Christ. He is the only voice that God will hear. If you do not speak through His Son, you can praise God to high heaven and your words go no higher than the ceiling. When you pray, there's only one who can carry your prayer into the presence of the Father. He is an intermediary, an advocate. There is one intermediary, one advocate between God and men. See? But Plato said demons. And remember now, when he said demon, he didn't say it in a bad sense. He simply said a demon is a spirit. These spirits are between God and men. They understood that. 2,000 years ago, when the New Testament was written, that's what they believed. Let me explain this. 2,000 years ago, in Galilee, of the Gentiles, which is which referred to north of Jerusalem, about 60 miles. Around that Sea of Galilee were scattered little towns all around. They can find them to this day. They were referred to as the Decapolis. Deca in, in uh, Greek is, in, is ten. Polis in Greek means city. So it is ten cities. Ten cities scattered around the Sea of Galilee. These were Greek cities, Greek culture, Greek-speaking people, see? Interme intermixed with the Hebrew, the Jew, who lived in places like Tiberias, which it, Tiberias itself was mixed somewhat, but uh, who did he upbraid? Who did the Lord Jesus Christ upbraid for their unbelief when he ministered in Galilee? Somebody name me one place. Woe unto the Bethsaida. Woe unto the Chorazin. See, 
He, he upbraided them for their unbelief. He didn't say, woe unto thee and name one of these Decapolis, one of these Greek cities. No, he came to Jews that lived in the north and preached the word of God to them. But their culture, the culture of these Greek-speaking cities, the Decapolis, spread. It affected the people around them. And it was a constant dogfight. And you can believe this. It was a dogfight between the Orthodox Jew and the culture of these, of these, of these uh, around them because of the, for example, the Romans always, when they moved into a place, the Romans always take the best they can find of whatever it is and just disseminate it into their culture. And uh, when I was in Athens, Greece, I went into the stadium where the first Olympics was held. And it's, it's nowhere near as big as some of the stadiums in this country. Nowhere near as big. But it was big for its time. And you need to understand this, that when they performed in those Olympics, they performed stark, raven, naked. Not a stitch on. Why? Because they worshipped the human form. And when they did that, what do you think that would do to a Pharisee? To see the young men of Israel being drawn off into these Greek-speaking cities who attended this and who had part in it, what do you think it'd do to them? Well, you're, you're talking about a dog fight and a half. What would it do to the average church today? Well, no big deal. I mean, you know. But what would it do to a church today that believed the Word of God? <laughs> Amen. It'd make a big difference, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. So 2,000 years ago, if you can, you can see how these Greek cities were so full of Greek culture that when, they, when it came to a demon, they understood it exactly the way Plato, Homer, Aristotle, Socrates, and the rest of them believed it. Now, if man wrote the Bible, then you'd have that in the New Testament. But you don't have that in the New Testament. It's a different story. Because the Bible reveals them for their true nature, for what they are. But that was the philosophy of that time. It was the prevailing belief among the people at that time, that a demon was a good thing. It was something that you'd want because the demon you wanted to communicate with. That's why you have the oracles of Delphi and all the rest of that stuff. Talking to spirits, talking to the spirit world, communicating with the spirits. Today they do the same thing. They have seances, have mediums, channelers, and all the rest of it. They're communicating with the spirit world. God says, leave it alone. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. You communicate with the spirit world, but you do it by the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter number 8. You do it in communication and communion with God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, born by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's communicating with the spirit world. Yes, it is. That's prayer. That's fellowship. That's unction where you talk to God and you talk to Him through the Holy Spirit who speaks to Him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else involved in it. You don't need to go to a man. You don't need some channeler. You don't need some... And if you go to a man and you go to an outfit like this who, who, who portrays themselves as being spiritual where they can contact the spirit world, you're dealing with a demon. And I'm going to tell you the truth, folks. A lot of uh, activity that goes on in the church is demonic. Especially the charismatic movement. It's got a lot of demonic stuff in it. No question about it. Some of these old writers use the word angels and demons indiscriminately. All right, now here we've got angels. See, if anybody should, be, should, be, should know the spirit world, it ought to be you. It ought to be Christians. You ought to know the truth about the spirit world. What's an angel? What's anything apart from God? Anything. A what? It's a creature. I don't care what it is. I don't care how powerful it is. Anything. Apart from the Almighty is a creature. It has limited knowledge. It has limited ability. It, uh, its ability and knowledge may be much greater than yours, but it's still limited. So is an angel. An angel is a creature. Angels do not know all things. In the book of Revelation just read to you where it says that God gave the angel the power to do this and to do that and to do this and do that. A lot of times in the sense where it says give them power, it's giving them authority to do it. Authority to be able to do it. So, yes, they did. And here's what one of them said. Philo of Alexandria says that souls, demons, and angels are only different names that imply one and the same substance. And he affirms that Moses calls those angels whom the philosophers call demons. Now, who's Philo? 
Philo of Alexandria. He was a Jew that lived in Alexandria, Egypt, back when Alexandria, Egypt still had the greatest library on the face of the earth. And Philo of Alexandria was a, he believed in the allegorical interpretation of the Old Testament. And Philo of Alexandria was one who, who was greatly influenced by Homer, Socrates, Plato, all the rest of this. So therefore, Philo's teachings and Philo's beliefs go over into modern Judaism. There's a group of Jews today who believe a lot like Philo of Alexandria believed. There's, there's a branch of Judaism today that is, that is vastly different from the standard Judaism that folks deal with. It's a Judaism that is altogether, uh, it interprets the scripture in an altogether different manner. But I don't know who, they, who these Jews are. They're different. They've got a different approach to the Bible, the Old Testament. These Jews are the kind of Jews that, uh, uh, for example, a Kairite Jew. A Kairite Jew is a Jew who rejects the teaching of the rabbis. Okay? A Kairite Jew rejects rabbinic Judaism. That's, that's remarkable. See? Because you wouldn't think such a group of Jews exist, but they do. They reject rabbinic Judaism. They reject it. So therefore, they reject the Talmud and all of that. Yes, sir. Uh, out in California, I had a chance to be around some Jews out there, and, and they don't even believe in God. They just go to the temple, and it's a social order. It, it, with them, it is a, it is a, it is a uh, uh, blood thing. It is, a, uh, it is their race. It's, uh, it's what they are, and, and still an atheist. And that's quite a thing, to be a Jew and an atheist. To them was given the oracles of God, you know. Uh, but uh, that's but but that's true. They are atheists, and uh, but claim to be Jews. Yes, you have the Masoretic Jews, who are the ones who who took care of the text, who made sure that the text was copied and presented and preserved generation after generation after generation. That's why you have the Masoretic vowel points on your new test your New Testament, so you can on the Old Testament rather, so you can read it. Because if it didn't happen, you couldn't read it. Couldn't read it. You couldn't. You couldn't interpret it. Couldn't read the words whatsoever. But there's a branch of Judaism that is uh, that is uh, uh, so different than all the rest of the branches of Judaism. It is mystical. It deals with the Bible in a allegorical type fashion, like Philo of Alexandria, and uh, it is the type of Judaism that, therefore, if the Bible says something. It doesn't necessarily mean what it says on the surface. There's a deeper hidden meaning to everything. When you get into the New Testament, you get into the same gra uh, group. The Gnostics were like that. Yes, sir. The Kabbalah. Kabbalistic. Uh, sure it is, because it appeals to the intellect. It's like the Church of Scientology. It appeals to the intellect, the head, not the heart. It puffs you up, blows you up. With superior knowledge. That's why the Gnostic, the word Gnostic is from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. See, I've got this great knowledge no one else has. Yes, ma'am? You were just going to... But that's what it is. Kabbalistic Jews. The Kabbalah. And the Kabbalah, of course, is a, is, uh, is a system of study. The Kabbalistic Jews. All right? So now, you're a Christian, right? I mean, you believe the Bible, right? Well, do you think you've got everything in the Bible you need? Don't you suppose God might have a few other books out there that could add a little bit to the Bible? I mean, after all, uh, we don't live like they did 2,000 years ago. We need something that addresses us today in our culture. Right? Wrong. Am I wrong? So you're, you're saying the Bible's good enough. How many believe that? Good night, man. <laughs> so you all believe the Bible then? All right. You believe the Biblios, the book. All right. Okay. So, do you believe then that Homer and Aristotle, Socrates, Maximander, Plato, and the rest of them, do you believe they had a higher knowledge of the spirit world than the Bible did? No. They were deceived. 
they were deceived. You'd be amazed, though, down through the years how some of the Christian commentators and Christian writers have praised Plato for the fact that, and here's why they praise him. They praise him because they knew he didn't have a Bible. They knew he didn't have an Old Testament. They knew he did not have revelation from God. Yet he understood the spirit world so good, so well, that they, plays, that they praised Plato. Now, there's no doubt, friend, if you're in darkness, you're in darkness. Amen. Right? You're in darkness. And how, where are you going to get light from? How are you going to know anything about anything? See? How are you going to know the spirit world? How are you going to understand anything about the spirit world if you're in darkness. You have no source of authority. See? This is why I stand here this morning before you and absolutely declare that, we no, we don't know everything. No. Hey, we're not the source of knowledge. No, but that book is. That Bible is the source of knowledge. And it will judge what any culture or any group of people says about, the, uh, about anything. You'll judge it by the Bible. All right. Now, uh, Plutarch, one of the old, uh, says, It is a very ancient opinion that there are certain wicked and malignant demons who envy good men and endeavor to hinder them in the pursuit of virtue, lest they should be partakers of greater happiness than they enjoy. So he had a kind of a different take on it. He began to look at it in a little different manner. I wonder where he got that. The New Testament writers, when it comes to the issue of demons, all right, now remember, let me say it one more time, not to, not to confuse anybody. When the, when, the, when, the, when, the New, when the New Testament was translated by these 50 men in 1611, when they translated this New Testament from the Greek manuscript, the Greek text, the Textus Receptus, when they came upon the word daimonion, they had to translate that word. All right. Sometimes they translated it evil spirit, wicked spirit. Sometimes they translated it gods. And you'll see how they chose the context to do it. And I'll show you how that the context shows why they did it. But the New Testament writers, not one time, this is what's important, not one time, not one time did the New Testament writers ever translate the word daimonion, demon, in a good sense. And the prevailing attitude of 2,000 years ago was that demons were essentially good good to have. And here and there, as I just read to you, this one Plutarch, for example, cast some of them in a bad light. So the New Testament does not draw from prevailing wisdom, does it? It does not draw from prevailing, prevailing wisdom. It draws from inspiration. In other words, Lord God, what is a demon? Lord God, you tell us what a demon is. We're not interested in what Plato had to say. What do you say a demon is? And you know what he told them? It's a wicked spirit. It's an evil spirit. James chapter number 3 and verse number 19, Revelation 16 verse 14 are two places. We won't take time to read all of them because I've got some other material I want to cover here. But these refer to them in a bad sense. In Acts chapter number 19, verses 12 and 13. Acts 19, verses 12 and 13. So from that, so that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs of aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now you'll notice here that there is a connection between diseases and evil spirits. But don't jump, don't jump the gun and think that every time somebody has an affliction that that's an evil spirit. That's a big mistake to make. But sometimes afflictions are associated with evil spirits, which is true. But it's going to take some discernment to know that. But in verse number 12, it says that the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And they attempted to cast these Daimonion out of them. Ta numata ta pana ra. Those are the Greek words. Let me say them again. Ta numata, pneumatos, pneuma, pneumatic drill. What's pneuma? Air. 
Ta, the definite article. The air, we would say today in Numa, but it's not talking about air. It's talking about what? Spirit. The spirit, the panera. Panera. Paneros. Wicked, evil. What do you call stuff that you, they call X-rated movies and X-rated photographs and X-rated stuff that you can, the garbage that's out there. What do they call that? Pornography. That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. The word pornography comes from a Greek word which means wicked, vile, malicious. There's nothing good in it. Nothing whatsoever good in it. But anyway, it's associated with the Spirit. And if you see in the book of Acts, chapter number 19, verse 13, 12 and 13, it's set in a wicked context. New Testament never sets a spirit, a daimonion, in a good context. They are intelligent beings. In Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 29, they, 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 they shudder in terror at the judgment to come. At the judgment to come. They are wicked spirits. They know what's going to happen. Most people are dumb to it. <laughs> but they know. They know. They know what's coming. In uh, Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 29, this is a very interesting thing right here. In Matthew chapter number 8 and verse 29. Very interesting. And when, verse 28, he was come to the other side in the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with daimonion, devils, coming out of the what? Tombs. Associated with dead bodies. Exceeding fear so that no man might pass by that way. Demon possessed in the graveyard. Demon possession, therefore, is associated with death. Demon possessions associated with sickness. Demon possessions associated with hallucinations. It's associated with wild behavior. Demon possessions associated with uncontrollable behavior. Demon possessions associated with all kinds of things that afflict mankind. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verses in 20 and 21. I want to show you some remarkable things now about what the Bible says about these demons. 1 Corinthians 10, 20, and 21. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to daimonion, devils, demons, and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with demons. Notice that a sacrifice is associated with it. They're doing the sacrificing. They're sacrificing. In other words, they're associated with a sacrifice. I don't need to belabor that, do I? There's one sacrifice once and for all and forever given. He offered himself one time. One time. And then sat down on the right hand of the Father. One sacrifice is enough. Absolute and complete. But Gentiles, not just in what you're thinking about, but many other ways, they, ha they have human sacrifice. The Mayan offered human sacrifice. The Mayans offered human beings as sacrifice. That's demon worship. The fact of the matter is that everywhere else on the face of the earth, without the truth of, the, without the truth of God, any worship is demon worship. Isn't that sad? It's demon worship. I don't care what it is. Demon worship. Some places it's more it's worse than others. For example, India. India has millions of gods, therefore they've got millions of demons. And the missionaries say the biggest problem with getting a Hindu saved is that uh, that uh, they'll accept Jesus as God, another one, and just put him in, in their pantheon of gods. See, well that's a problem. Jesus is not another god. Now, who's teaching that today? What culture is teaching that Buddha, Jesus, Confucius, Mohammed, uh, all the rest of the gods, that your way is okay, that's your way, that's relativism? What culture is teaching that today? What are, you, what are you getting pumped out across TV daily through the news media, 
through the through the literature. What culture do you know of right now that is constantly bombarding you with the idea that your religion's okay? That's your religion. He's got his religion. He's got what is it? And that's right in the smack in the middle of it. Yes, that's that's one of the that's one of the uh, sources of it. It's America. It's America. It's America, folks. Now. If you're not worshiping the true God, what are you worshiping? What? You're worshiping a demon. Now, the Apostle Paul says we know that an idol is nothing. He knows that. He said that. It's nothing. It's nothing. But things represent other things. They stand for things. It is not the thing itself, but it's what is associated with it. It's how that something can be transmitted through it. It's what's behind it. It's what energizes it. The Apostle Paul says an idol's nothing. He says, but that demon that's connected with it is something. So when they're worshiping the idol, the idol itself is dumb, deaf. Paul, the Old Testament writer said, you chop a tree down, fashion any way you want to. It can't hear, can't speak. It's nothing. But what's behind it? See, it's that spirit that's connecting. That's the issue. So the, so the Gentiles, when they worship, they're worshiping demons. Demons like to be worshipped. They're vain. They let people fall at their feet. If you make an idol out of a human being, and they do, they either bounce a little round ball or they carry a little long ball or they, they hit a little ball or they, or they get on TV and they, they're beautiful they are. And they're actors or actresses or what have you. And people just fall at their feet. Well, they are nothing. I hate to say that to them. That's... I hate to bust their bubble. But according to the Bible, they're nothing. But the spirit behind them is something. Whether you like it or not, when you are worshiping a human being, you are worshiping a demon. Amen. That's sad business. Because if you really got to look at that demon, you wouldn't worship it. It'd scare you to death. If you saw it for what it really is. So... They were exorcist, and they tried to cast out demons, and the demons, of course, were associated with that. Now, look at the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 18. Here's an interesting place in the New Testament. Acts, chapter number 17, verse 18. Now, these were the smart people. These were the philosophers, verse 18. Phileo, that's love. Sophist is wisdom. That's what one of them called Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. They called him a sophist. Yeah, that's what they called him. One of them, I forget who it was. I read it somewhere. They called Jesus Christ a sophist. In other words, he was a kind of like a philosopher, a wise person. I'm not so sure he put it in a bad context, but a philosopher is a lover of wisdom. Okay? So now look at this carefully. Verse 18. Then certain philosophers we have here, of the Epicureans and the Stoics, that's two entirely different attitudes toward life. We don't have time for that, but look at this. Encountered him and said some, What will this babbler say? Others some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now here's what they said. That word gods right there is daimonion. See? demon now now let's we've done gone through quite a bit here we've been carrying on somebody tell me what they said look open it up all right we'll close that with this open that up what did he say what what did these epicureans and stoics really say when the when they when they talked about this what they say all right but how did they mean it remember what i told you that they that these people believe 2000 years all right okay Uh-huh. All right. We're good now so far. Is there more here? Just another just another one. Just another one. Yes, to add an, uh, well to the, you know what the occasion was. What is it here? I mean, when they've got an altar to what? Right. Okay, so they've got an altar to the unknown god. Now, does that mean that they were polytheist? 
Yes. Poly means many gods. Polytheist. Pantheist means gods in it. Polytheist means there's many gods, okay? All right. So they said he's a setter forth of strange gods. All right. They had Athena up on top of the hill. She's the virgin. See? All right, brother. Uh huh. Strange, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's the str- to me that would be the strange part if they didn't if he just preached Jesus it'd be one thing, but the, the doctrine of the resurrection and that he was resurrected that's what made it strange and different. I think, right, right, right. Okay. Did the apostles have a hard time believing in the resurrection till he showed up? Yes. Okay. That's a strange thing, wasn't it? It wasn't something they could latch on to real quickly. And even Thomas denied it, right? But now when you look at this thing, he's a setter forth of strange daimonion, okay? Strange, intelligent spirits that may necessarily be good to have. See? In other words, did they say this in a bad sense or did they say this in a good sense or did they say this in a kind of a Middle of the road, uncertain sense. Maybe good, maybe bad. We're not sure which one it is. That's right. They were curious. They were curious. They didn't just turn him off, did they? No. They they believed in a in the uh, you know the go down to the agora. That's the marketplace. Have us a little forum down there, and let's uh, somebody stand up on a stump and tell us what you think, and and uh, so let's hear it. All right. That's why the Apostle Paul says we are made spectacles to the world. That's what he's talking about. Yes, sir. They also, from what you just said, mm-hmm. they, they sounded like a lot of the, uh, the liberals today about tolerance. Boy, you got that now, don't you? you know, yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're very tolerant. They're philosophers. <laughs> discuss everything. And they're tolerant of everything but one thing. Right. And that's Christianity because we're definitive and not tolerant. We're definitive and absolute. There is only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. That's what the Romans had a problem with. The Romans said, you believe in Jesus? Believe in Jesus. Romans said that. No problem with us. You worship uh, this this, uh, Caesar. He's the Pontifus Maximus. He He has his vestal virgins. He is God in flesh. Now, you worship Jesus? Go ahead, but you're going to have to worship this Roman Caesar too. What did they say? What did the Christians say to him? He said, no, sorry. We'll worship Jesus and him alone. And that's it, period. goes no further. Then they said, well, we can't have your religion among our rest of our religions. There's nothing in your religion we want. We're going to take you out into the Colosseum and throw you to the lions. That's why they threw them to the lions. Not because they were Christians. It was because they would not... Yield to the fact that Jesus Christ and Him alone was to be worshipped. And not, and not the Pontifus Maximus. You know what that means? What? Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. Pontifus Maximus means great father. See? Pontifus. He took that term. He's, tra- he's the Caesar, alright? He's Caesar. But he's the Pontifus Maximus. He has, he's not only the head of a state, he's the head of a religion. That's important to understand. Very important. He's the head of state. He's the Caesar. That's why the Russians up there borrowed from the Greek language and they borrowed the, the term Caesar. You know how they say it in Russia. Czar. He's the head of state and he's also the head of the church. He's the Pontifus Maximus. He had two heads right there. Okay. And he put the Christians to death because they would not recognize him as the Holy Father. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Caesar of Rome. Pope is another word for father. Papa. Papa. The Holy Father. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, they wouldn't bow to it. Now, if you're worshiping, <laughs> if you're worshiping the Holy Father, <laughs> If 2,000 years ago, if you were worshiping the Pontifus Maximus as the incarnation of God in flesh, what were you worshiping? You were worshiping a demon.
the Caesar wasn't a demon. He was not a demon. It's the spirit behind him. The man is not the demon. It's the spirit behind him. Father, I pray you'd use what I've said, Lord, in Jesus' name. Bless my brothers and sisters and help us as we study your word. In thy holy name we pray. Amen.